All righty. Welcome back for another episode of Two Plain Sports. Today is Wednesday, January 11th, and we have a permanent wide receivers coach for the University of Oklahoma. Oklahoma landed another wide receiver transfer. Oklahoma also landed a defensive lineman transfer. A lot of things are moving there. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the addition of Emmett Jones at the full-time wide receiver uh, position. We're also going to be talking about what is what happens to Damian Washington. Where does he potentially go? The additions of Andre Anthony, uh, Devon Sears, David Wegbu hitting the portal. So a lot of things that a lot of good things to talk about, um, and a lot of things that are you know this team's moving and shuffling around. That I mean we're gonna this the way that this is going. We're the team we're going to see in 2023 is going to be totally different. We're going to have a ton of guys that we don't even know or who didn't even play in the 22 season, which is kind of crazy to even think about. So, but before we get into it, I just want to say appreciate it. We're like 40 subscribers away from 5,600 subscribers. If you're new here, if you've been here often, hit the subscribe button. It's free and easy. Uh, turn the notification bell on so you know when we post. And then like the video, comment on the video. You'll have to stay around for the NVIDIA video challenge. And then follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Apple, Spotify, and TikTok. I know there's probably a lot of TikTokers out there. Everything will be linked in the description below. I'm not a big TikToker, but I know a lot of people are. And Jose and Brandon give me a lot of uh, a hard time for it, for not being a big TikTok guy. So um, so I think we got to get into the most pressing news, I would say, is the addition of Emmett Jones. Emmett Jones, um, not I mean, he's very familiar with the Big 12. To be completely honest with you, I wasn't overly familiar with him until... Um, the announcement of his of his um, you know signing with Oklahoma and taking the job, but you know so many people were floated around you know potentially Malcolm Kelly and and, um, and Rashad Samples and other people that were potentially going to take the job and uh, obviously nothing came to fruition. Oklahoma identified Jones, went after him, and it seemed like it was a really quick process once they identified him and locked him down. What are your thoughts? I mean, he is from the DFW area, coached in high school, stayed in the Big 12. What's your what are your thoughts on him? Well, it seems like he definitely wasn't Oklahoma's first choice, which you know, you 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 miss sometimes on on your first choice and maybe not even a second. I really never really bought into the Malcolm Kelly stuff. It seemed like it was just more fans wanted to try to bring back someone that played at OU and has done well as a coach and recruiter. Uh, I'm not sure if that was ever actual an actual interest, a mutual interest from OU and Malcolm. But I think Emmett Jones is a good recruiter. I think he's going to help with the Dallas area. I think we were talking about it before and what what is selling me – on him being a good wide receivers coach is his time at uh, Texas tech the first time around when he coached with under Cliff Kingsbury. Um, he was a director of player development and then got promoted during his time there the first time around before moving on to Kansas. And he clearly, I mean, I know think whatever you want about Cliff. I know he just got fired from Arizona, but, he has pretty good offenses, at least at the college level. He had pretty decent offenses. I know it's not what Oklahoma had, but they were still one of the better total offenses in the country. That means the wide receivers had to be pretty good catching the ball. That was a big uh, issue with the receivers last year. So hopefully helping them out with those concentration issues when it comes on the field, you know, catch the ball, then turn around and run rather than trying to turn as you're catching. See, it, we saw that issue happen quite a bit of times. This last season, um, and then recruiting wise, like I said, helping lock down the Dallas area because he is he coached high school there. I believe he's from Texas, so he's very familiar with the program. And then he just coached with Joe McGuire, who is known for the connections he has in the in the Texas high school, um, you know, with within the programs at, at, of Texas high school football. We'll see how it goes. I think. I don't know. I saw someone say that it's going to upgrade the the wide receiver room from like a C to a B plus. I, like I said, I, I'm just not sure exactly how how much it'll help in year one. But the good thing is it seems like we'll at least have consistency, which has been an issue of late. You know, going from, um, you know, when Lincoln left with Coach Simmons, 
and then that that made it down. So we went, went from two wide receivers coaches to one with Kale. Then Kale resigned, and then we had LD Washington, and that was only an interim. It's hard for interim coaches to to keep the job. You really have to like excel. Um, and I don't think that recruiting was really an issue. Um, could did we miss on some? Sure, but like we still got Jaquez Petaway, a top one hundred player, four star receiver. Keon Brown is good, is a good wide receiver. We definitely did not do as well as you know we'd expect because it did seem like Oklahoma was in on quite a few more receivers than they just missed. But um, this is. This should at least help alleviate some of those um, misses down the road. It'll be interesting to see how much of a wall Oklahoma can really put up within Texas football, because it seems like that's really where we're focusing. That and Florida. Those are the two states that OU and this 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 staff overall really wants to pull from from the most for the most part. They'll pull some guys from California, and that seems like it's like a developing process still, because you know these the coaching staff on the defensive side of the ball was on the East coast. They're kind of used to that, that culture. They're used to recruiting over there. So they're still trying to work, work their way West um, to try to pull some guys from, from California. It just doesn't seem like it's going to be a priority like it was for the last staff. And I think I do agree with you because this staff is trying to build a wall around the state of Texas, at least, you know, North Texas, the DFW area and North, you know, basically Oklahoma South they are trying to lock down this area because it's full of talent. I mean, as far as, you know, all the Texas fans give Oklahoma a hard time about most of our great players are from the state of Texas. And that's, that might be true. I mean, it probably is, but there's only so many spots to play at the university of Texas and Texas A&M. There's no shame with Oklahoma pulling from the state of Texas, just because the kids from Texas doesn't mean, you know, it's, it's a bad thing. So with the, the focus on Texas, it makes a lot of sense. Why why the previous staff never really put a huge emphasis on the state of Texas and really cared more about like the state of California? I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, California is important. California produces top players year in and year out. But when you have a state that's, you know, a plane ride away compared to the state of Texas that is just a short car ride away, I mean, you've got the DFW area two, three hours away. I mean, a lot of kids are able to have their families come up to most games. So it makes a lot of sense there with his connections to the state of Texas. I mean, he's been in the big 12 coached at Texas tech twice, been to Kansas was an interim head coach. Once less miles was let go. So he's able to have that perspective as well. He's been around for a while. He's not necessarily a guy that's an unproven commodity per se. He's got some track track history. Um, you know, like a Rashad samples was a very, up and coming coach, he he felt like a guy that if things went well in a couple of years, he'd be gone. I'm not saying that Emmett Jones couldn't have two great years and get an opportunity to be an offensive coordinator because he very well might, but he feels like a guy that would be committed to the program for maybe close to four years and four or five years because he he hasn't really jumped around too much when he when when he didn't have the opportunity to stay. Like he he only made moves when he had to. I mean, think about it, because he was with Cle- Cliff Kingsbury. Kingsbury got fired. Les Miles got fired. I mean, so he's had to move. This is like his first move in a while where it's been under his home, own terms, it seems like anyway. I mean, obviously, from the outside looking in, I don't know his previous two stints with Tex, Texas Tech and, and uh, Kansas. But, you know, he's making a move for himself. And obviously, Texas made a run at him as well. And he chose Oklahoma. I don't know what the contract is, but I'm sure Oklahoma's paying him well. But he probably, it seemed like he picked Oklahoma because of stability. And we're close to the DFW area, and that's where he is going to recruit. And I think you're going to see a lot of offers in the 2024 and even the 25 class of the wide receiver position get sent out as soon as possible because you got to hit the ground running at this point. You know, they're, it, it's kind of the same thing that the staff did when they all got hired in last year. They had to play catch up. He's going to have to play catch up because I think they've kind of held back on some of the offers with the idea of letting the permanent wide receivers coach make the offers and identify his guys. So I'm excited. Um, I wasn't necessarily expecting it, but he's a guy that has a ton of experience. And the brand of Oklahoma should help them in recruiting itself. Like I'm sure some of you have gone in 
looked at the two two four seven profile on him and looked at his recruiting. We can all be honest and say like it's not like he's pulling five star players, high four star players, but you can also see like the places he's coached, Texas Tech. As explosive as those offenses were with Cliff Kingsbury, it's not like they were ever a destination. You know, Texas Tech really isn't ever a destination for a player, but a brand like Oklahoma is. You know, it it, it should help him get those. If he is as good of a recruiter as he is said to be, then the brand of help of Oklahoma should help him that much more and get and being able to lock in a a five star wide receiver, a high four star more often than he did in the past. And then you brought up a good point that I hadn't even thought of. I know I mentioned like what was convincing me of him being a good coach for wide receivers was his time at uh, Texas Tech with Cliff, but he's bouncing around and he's learning from a lot of coaches that were pretty good, at least on the offensive side of the ball. And he actually did coach under Lance Leopold for a year before moving on to Texas Tech. So he can pull knowledge and help Jeff Levy develop the passing game because it was the passing game seemed like it was either screens, jet sweeps, or deep, deep balls. Like they didn't seem to have anything in the intermediate um, route tree where you feel confident that this, you know, this team and this offense can, you know, hold the ball for a little bit win the time of possession, which is something that we talk about a lot during the season. We It seemed like Oklahoma could never win the time of possession because this offense was moving so fast that it was either going to be you know, a few explosive plays that got them in the end zone really quickly, or they're going to go three and out because all they could do is play along the line of scrimmage. Like this passing game should develop and improve and get a little bit more creative because now you've got two minds in here. I think that's something that we were missing with LD and maybe something that as fans we might have overlooked because they, it did go after Kale resigned, it did go from two minds working on the passing game to one. I mean, you have DeMarco and Coach B there to help with the run game, but Jeff Lebby was the sole, really probably the sole contributor when it came to developing the passing game because I'm assuming the staff was aware that LD was more than likely not going to be the long term solution at wide receiver since he really never had that interim title. It didn't seem like the interim title was ever going to get pulled off and him just be the full-time wide receivers coach. So and now you've got a, you know, potentially a better situation where the minds behind the game plan are going to be more creative overall. So the offense, while it was explosive last year, should get at least better and more consistent and better situationally. That's something Levy was not great at last year. So hopefully that's something that um, Jones can come in and help out a little bit because situational football for the offense was not fantastic for a good portion of the games. It definitely wasn't. And a guy like him, Emmett, who's been around at different programs, he probably can teach a lot to Jeff Levy. I mean, you made up, you brought up a good point that he's got experience you know, with him potentially getting the passing game coordinator title, I don't know if he will or not. It would make sense since he's had it before um, to come in and provide experience and help assist with with things like that. It makes a lot of sense. So I think he's a solid hire. I think that Oklahoma's got a guy that is going to be able to recruit at an extremely high level and develop talent and put talent in the NFL. And that's what we want. And I think we're going to see the wide receiver play take a step forward again you know we we kind of regressed a little bit still had some good receivers and great you know Marvin Mims had a career year but I think we're going to see the wide receiver room as a whole take that next step and that next step who's going to be a part of it is a guy that announced his commitment to Oklahoma uh, through the transfer portal is Andrell Anthony Uh, we've talked about Andrell Anthony Um, He came in for a visit this past weekend. He's coming in from Michigan with two years of eligibility. He really came on as a true freshman. um, And he, he really emerged as a true freshman, you know, with a lot of hype, a lot of expectations, and he never, it never really materialized. And it seemed like to be more of a system problem than maybe a player problem. He has a lot of potential, 
Uh, I'm not saying that he's going to be a day one starter when he transfers in. Maybe he's a guy that comes in and is like, I think we mentioned before, could he just red shirt this year and then contribute his, you know, last two years in the 24 and 25 year, maybe, or does he come in and he emerges immediately? I, you know, it's tough to say. I mean, it's all speculation at this point, but I think he might've committed knowing that Emmett Jones was going to be the guy and could, could have Emmett Jones with him coming in, could Emmett Jones have had an impact on Anthony's decision? He might've, I don't, I don't know, but I would think, Anthony would not have committed without knowing who his coach was going to be. So I, I, I feel like he probably had an idea of who they were targeting. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't think that's completely true because then you also have guys like Jaquez Petaway, Keon Brown, pretty much the rest of the, everyone in the wide receiver room. I'm sure that they were maybe given a heads up that LD wasn't going to be their full-time coach um, at some point. You know, in the last couple of days, once the decision seemed to be a little bit closer to final. But I can't imagine that they knew, especially Anthony, knew who the coach was going to be pre-decision. Maybe he found out right before and it helped him pull the trigger um, to to finalize it. Maybe that's something that that sold him. Um, But there's probably more so like Lebby, Venables, I think Vola is like super involved in pretty much every kid's recruitment for the most part, no matter what side of the ball. So just goes to show you that just because you don't have the the guy in place doesn't mean that the rest of the staff can't, you know, help out and, and just lock in some of these guys that they're looking for. Cause that's something I've seen on Twitter recently saying that because we don't have a wide receivers coach or not a good enough wide receivers coach that we were going to miss on, we were missing on a lot of transfer targets. Like at, you miss. I don't know what people don't understand about that when it comes to sports, especially in recruiting. Like this isn't science. This isn't a, a, a math equation that there's one right answer for every situation. They're dealing with people. And at the end of the day, they're dealing, dealing with young people where they're trying. A, a drum has said it before um, on one of their live streams, like they're trying to not disappoint their families, their friends, the people that are closer to them. And they're also trying to make the best decision that they feel is best for themselves. And sometimes it's not Oklahoma, but when it is Oklahoma, we should get excited about it. I think Anthony, I think I'm, as we talked about it, talked about him last time. I'm not sure if he can find a spot next year, but Mims leaving definitely opens up an opportunity for any of the wide receivers. Jaquez is going to be a guy that's going to be hard to keep off the field because of how fast he is. Now, Andrew is also pretty fast. His one touchdown this year was off of like a slant route and he took it to the house for like 60 or 70 yards. So he's got wheels on him. It's just going to be who can be, who can learn the playbook faster at this point. And I don't believe Petaway is a mid-year enrollee. I could be wrong, but if, he's not then andrew has a whole semester to to get ahead of him and the with the playbook and getting to getting comfortable with um dylan gabriel which is going to be important because that's something that you know could help with not having so many misses like we saw early on in the year so we've got definitely the wide receiver situation is going to be different from what we've experienced over the last few years where there's a little bit more uncertainty on who could be wide receiver two, or even wide receiver one, if Joel Farouk doesn't make the big jump that we all expect him to. Yeah. And, you know, not only losing Marvin Mims, but Oklahoma did lose Theo Weiss. So there are two positions of guys that contributed. And now Theo Weiss didn't contribute quite as much as Marvin Mims, obviously, but they were both contributors and they're both, both of their positions will be open for um, competition. And Anthony might get, might get an edge, because like you said, if if I because I don't know either of Jaquez Petaway, I can't remember. Um, even if Petaway's there, let's just say hypothetically he is there. Anthony's been in college for two years. I know it's been at Michigan, but there has to be something said for that. You know, he he already made the transition from high school to college. He understands that whole personal transition and then the whole development, you know, at the higher level. So Anthony comes in, I would think he has an edge. But Petaway's talent is undeniable, and it's tough to keep a guy like him off the field. Now, I do see Oklahoma 
continuing to pursue another transfer at the wide receiver position. And someone we've talked about is Tyrone Broden. Um, his announcement should be coming soon, uh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, uh, that he's supposed to announce. I'm not sure that Oklahoma's the spot for, for Broden. I'd be happy if he is because, I mean, we've talked about him on the show. He's 6'7". I know he played at Bowling Green. Jose, you're not quite as high on him as I, I am. But he's 6'7". He's large. Maybe, I, maybe I'm more high on him just because I'm scarred from Johnny Wilson being 6'7". Um, and just having a guy like him just would be great. Um, but, you know, he visited Oklahoma and Penn State. Seems to be coming down to two schools, you would imagine. Yeah, he's uh... – Seems like he's keeping things close to the vest, so it'll be a surprise for everyone. Hopefully it is for Oklahoma. He is announcing today. He did not say what time. He just mentioned that the announcement was coming sometime today. So it could have already happened as you guys are watching this video, or it could be in the next couple of hours. We'll see. Assuming everything goes to plan, of course. You know, you never yeah, yeah, know. Yeah, I guess I this, like... this stuff can always change. But again, transfer. He's got to make this decision uh, soon because class starts in – a week, a week or so. Yeah, I think it's Tuesday. It's class yeah. start, which is just crazy. Um, so, you know, talking about Emmett Jones and the potential, you know, with him coming over, you and I were talking a little bit, or I brought it up before. Could a, a guy like Jones leaving make a current wide receiver at Texas Tech think about entering the transport? Because obviously we've talked about guys that commit to coaches, they commit to their their coaches that they're going to be working with year in, year out. And Emmett Jones has recruited some of these kids that are at Texas Tech, or maybe they haven't, but they probably like Jones. Um, you know, obviously, he had a lot of guys that excelled in the system uh, from his coaching, and I'm sure the offensive coordinator worked together with him. But there's a couple guys on that roster that if they did decide to enter the transfer portal, I think Oklahoma would be – going after i'm not saying that they're going to enter the transfer portal by any means i'm just saying you know there's sometimes is like an aftermath of someone leaving so you look at it you could have jaron bradley which jaron bradley is a red shirt freshman 6'5 215 pounds a huge guy red shirt as a red shirt freshman had 744 yards and six touchdowns 6'5 um just i mean he's huge and someone that produced on the field. And then you also look at like a Miles Price or a Fungi, uh, Luke Fungi. Um, they both contributed. Each had, Fungi had 450 yards. Uh, Price had a little over 500. They both contributed. So all three of these guys have a couple years, you know, two or three years of eligibility left. And what I find it so impressive is the fact that at the, at the quarterback position, Texas Tech had three quarterbacks throw for over a thousand yards each. So the inconsistency at quarterback did not limit the production at the wide receiver position. Now, did they have a thousand yard receiver? No, but they had three guys over 500 yards, which is pretty darn good. And then Fungi was just right on the edge at 451. So could three of their top four wide receivers and Xavier White's going to graduate, could one of them potentially into the transport? Maybe. And I would feel like that Oklahoma would pursue one of those guys because of the relationship, Big 12. Um, obviously, Jaron Bradley is the guy that everyone would want if he entered the transport, not just Oklahoma. I mean, I think every Power 5 program, large Power 5 program would go after him. But you would think that Oklahoma would have the inside track, hypothetically, if he did enter the transport. What do you think? All right, what I was saying with Jaron Bradley would definitely just depend on how Brent Venables would want to deal with that situation because, as we all know, he didn't want to take anyone from Clemson. It's not like Clemson did have a lot of people enter the transfer portal, but he's also a guy that clearly doesn't want to try to poach his a previous program, and I would assume that's an that's expectation he has for even the incoming coaches. If Jaron Bradley does go in, into the transfer portal, I would like to think Oklahoma would be the favorite there because of Jones, because of the 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 offense can be so explosive. I mean, I just looked it up because I wanted to see how because clearly Texas Tech put up a hell of points on Oklahoma. He led the team in receiving eight catches, 173 yards, and a touchdown. 
and he caught a long his longest catch of that game was 44 yards. That was the longest catch of any wide receiver for that um, Texas Tech offense on that day. So he can make explosive plays. Like you said, he's a big dude at 6'5". That would be the prime candidate for what Levy looks for in a wide receiver too. Wide receiver as well. It looks like for the most part, they're going after 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", guys. He'd fit the mold. Explosive guy, has speed. So I don't know, if, like you said, I don't know if these guys would enter the portal because Joey McGuire is very good at recruiting. But if they do, especially one of the wide receivers wants to leave because his coach left, Oklahoma would have to be. If, you, if, they, if Oklahoma wouldn't land one of them, it would be probably a bigger disappointment than not landing a high school kid because at least with the high school kids, you can assume that, you know, other, other teams either threw more money at them or they just made a better connection with a different coach. But Jones has had at least one year with each of these players and Oklahoma has the brand to put these guys in a position to get drafted higher than they maybe would have if they just stayed at tech. And Fungi is also 6'4". So, you know, either one of those guys would bring the size. Um, Miles Price is 5'10", so he's a little bit shorter of a guy. But, um, you know, 6'4", 6'5", both be great. Um, if they do enter the transfer portal, and I agree, if if they hypothetically if they did and Oklahoma ended up not getting them or getting one of them, it would be, it would be disappointing. But I'd like to think that Oklahoma would be in a good spot. So I guess we'll see something to definitely watch. Um but I think that's enough for the wide receiver talk. Do you have anything else to add on the wide receiver? All right. So we'll move on. Oklahoma picked up another transfer commit. Um, this one was on Monday. Devon Sears Jr. Um, picked, he picked Oklahoma over Tennessee, uh, Penn State. Those were his top three with Oklahoma. He also had offers from like USC, Florida, um, and some others. So he visited Oklahoma on the 4th. And he picked Oklahoma room, obviously. He had one sack, uh, a couple pass deflections, 15 total tackles from Texas State. Um, he joins a quite a haul along the defensive line as far as the transfers go. Uh, Jacob Lacey, Ronald Bothred, Trace Ford, and now Devon Sears. So there's four new guys coming in along with the, you know, the true freshmen that are coming in as well. I... I'm happy that he's here. I mean, he's probably going to, obviously he's going to play the interior. They're looking for a guy to fill up the middle of the, you know, basically replace Jeffrey Johnson. That's what they're looking for. And because Johnson is a, a large guy and someone that definitely filled up the interior of the defensive line, they needed to pair him up with Isaiah Coe. So, and also OU lost Joshua Ellison. So there's another reason why Devon Sears was that important. Now the question becomes, does Oklahoma get another interior defensive lineman. I'm not sure that they're able to, not anyone that I really know of, but I'm glad Sears is on board. I see him coming in potentially contributing in a ro- like in a rotational extent. I don't see him maybe being like the clear number one guy, but at the end of the day, nearly 300 pounds is someone that we need. Yeah, I agree. And um, we forgot to mention it when we were talking about the wide receivers, and it, but it, it kind of bleeds into this as well. If any more transfers do happen if it's guys leaving Oklahoma or guys that Oklahoma would target, they would need to enter the portal by the 18th. So we're really just a few days away. We, you know, if a Texas tech receiver does end up leaving Texas tech and enters the portal, we would know soon enough. And with the defensive line, I don't, I agree with you. I'm not sure if they're looking to try to add more defensive linemen. I mean, they, you, they have four, did you mention Desan McCullough, which is a guy that could rush the passer if they didn't? If... I, I did not, no. Yeah, so uh, they four defensive linemen, five guys that could rush the passer in, in a given situation, right? I think what – and we talked about it a little bit. What Sears gives them is, one, a big body because the only one really left is Isaiah Coe, and two, more depth, which is something that seems to be needed because – so I mentioned last time, I think it's fair to say that this offensive line unit was not very good last year. And it could be because they weren't prepared for this defense and they needed a year under their belt, or they just were getting gassed way too quick. Because when they the defense start did start performing well, they were on the field for like 35 plus minutes for some of these games, which can get exhausting. 
and getting more guys that can get fresh legs, especially when they get a stop and they get an opportunity to do some subs, this will help. He might not be a guy that's going to stuff the stat sheet, but he will at least be someone that can help when it comes to keeping everyone's legs fresh for the entirety of the game, especially if OU's offense isn't going to change tempo-wise, if we're going to see this extremely fast-paced offense that will probably never win the time of possession, they're going to need as many guys pretty much on the defensive unit that are ready to come in, even if it's just for like 10 snaps a game, just to keep everyone fresh for, for as long as they have to be on the field. Because being on the field for 35 minutes for the defense is brutal. Extremely brutal. I mean, especially if you're just playing a, an explosive offense as well. I mean, that just adds a whole different layer. So glad they got them. Um, they're they're picking up guys left and right. What is that? Is that a total of nine commitments for, through the transfer portal? Um, a total of 25 from the high school ranks. So a total of 34 new players to Oklahoma. That's That's a roster overhaul pretty much in one cycle. Um, so they're quickly turning this roster around to what Venables and his staff see fit. And they are making making do with what they have to in the transfer portal while high school recruiting catches up. So another transfer portal along the defensive line, this time is a casualty for Oklahoma. David Owegbu entered into the transfer portal. He is using his last year of eligibility. It will be elsewhere. Owegbu. He's coming from, and he's originally from Houston, 6'4", about 240 pounds. He was second on team for total tackles at 109. He had a couple sacks. Um, he was an all Big 12 honorable mention guy. Someone that played a lot. I know he at times made great plays. At times it wasn't so great just because I felt like maybe the position that he was put in wasn't his natural fit. But with him leaving... And I, I don't want to understate the importance as far as of him leaving is, you know, he played like 90% of the snaps for, for the defense and already a defense that was really thin at that linebacker position. And he leaves and now obviously opens up the door. You've got Stutzman. Naturally, you think Jaron Kanek is going to be this, be the guy here because you've got Deshaun McCullough in the, in the cheetah position. So Jaron Kanek will not be a cheetah. So you've got your starting linebackers now. But the question becomes, is there enough depth that can play in relief of these starters that allows, you know, when you have a 35-minute possession game, is there enough there? And I'm not 100% sure there is. I know that they've got Kobe McKenzie, uh, Kip Lewis, obviously Samuel Omosigo, Phil Pachati, Lewis Carter, Shane Witter. They've got, and Shane Witter really needs to emerge. They've got a lot of talent. And a, but a lot of their talent will be either freshmen or redshirt freshmen. I think we're going to see some growing pains again. What do you think? You're probably right. It, it seems like a fair assessment at this point. Um, I was definitely critical of a way boo last season because, and it wasn't because he couldn't tackle. I mean, that, the entire defense had that problem. And some day, some days it, he was just too slow. For, for what was asked of him, it seemed like. Like you said, it just doesn't seem that the linebacker spot was the spot where he was going to naturally excel. Even after losing, I think you mentioned it at the beginning of last season, like 15, 20 pounds um, from the end of last year to the beginning of this season didn't really help him enough to get that speed up, to keep up with what was demanded of him against Big 12 offenses. Jerry Kanick definitely less likely to have that problem. I think Kip Lewis is a guy that a lot of people are over just kind of overseeing going right to Kobe McKenzie. Not that Kobe McKenzie isn't a guy that we should be, we should be excited about, but Kip Lewis actually played on the football field last year. It's a guy that already shown that coaches trust him. One of the biggest criticisms that Venables had about him early on at Oklahoma was he just wasn't physically prepared, but mentally he was there, which is a thing that this coaching staff values, especially on the defensive side of the ball. If he knows the playbook even better by the start of next season, I could say keep I could see Kip Lewis being and Jaron Kanick being the guys that get the first opportunity to take uh, David's spot next season. It's really just going to be how they fit. 
because Awegbu was much more of the run stopper. And I think that kind of favors Kip's ability so far because Jaren Kanek plays a, a lot more like Danny Stutzman than Kip Lewis does. So maybe it'll be a situational thing. Maybe we'll see a lot more rotating of the linebackers next season. But I think Kip Lewis is a guy that people need to watch out for because he played last year as a true freshman. I know it wasn't a lot, but he played and he has just even more time to understand the playbook, even more time now to, to get bigger and heavier and stronger to be ready to play these more physical teams. That's just, I I think it's, if, if you over, if you overlook him, you're going to be caught off guard when he, when he bounces on the scene because he's, he's going to be a big time linebacker for Oklahoma in my opinion. No, I definitely agree. And someone I want to see, and they're going to have every opportunity to, is Shane Witter. And when you look at Shane Witter, he's a guy that came in. um, He was a four-star guy, top 200 player, had a lot of um, momentum behind him. Now, he did have shoulder injury. He had shoulder surgery in early October of this season, so he only played in four games. Um, But what's great about where Witter's at right now is he came in, he played in the 2020 season. Doesn't count. He played in 21. He burned a year of eligibility there. 2022, um, he had surgery, so he only played in four games. So whether it's a medical redshirt or a regular redshirt, 2022 is not going to count against him. So in theory, if I'm understanding this correctly, he should have three years of eligibility left at this point, assuming that the COVID year is taken out and this is a medical redshirt year. Um, he should have three more years. At a minimum, he has two. He should have three. Witters had a whole year, at least in the system, to be mentally engaged and understand the playbook. Hopefully, he has a great rehab and, and is able to go come come springtime. I'm not sure when he will be or you know, maybe by summer ball he'll be ready to go. That is someone that it's now or never for him. Whether he has two or three years of eligibility left doesn't really matter. But if he does not emerge this year, he's going to be someone that could potentially enter the transfer portal after the 23 season because we've been talking about, I mean, Kip Lewis has a lot of talent. Kobe McKenzie, Lewis Carter, Samuel Almosigo, Bill Machadi, all these young bucks are coming up. And you give them a whole year, playing time is going to be really hard to come by in this linebacker room by the 24 season. So he's going to have every opportunity to emerge. He's going to have plenty of eligibility to become a – fixture in this defense with Jaron Kanick and with the Danny Stutzman. It's just a matter of, can he do it? I think he can. He has all the tools. There's a reason why he was such a highly rated recruit coming out of high school. I mean, he had a total of 123 tackles and 14 tackles for loss in the senior season. So he played extremely well. It's just a matter of, can he put it on the field and stay healthy? I think he can. I certainly hope he will, but if not, these freshmen, redshirt freshmen, and these true freshmen are going to take snaps away from them. Agreed. So, well, I think that's really about everything that I've got. Uh, do you have any final thoughts related to anything we talked about, or I guess anything else? Nope. Um, I guess the, the end of video challenge, we're just going to go back to the national championship. I clearly missed so hard on that. But I don't think anyone could have really guessed that Georgia was going to absolutely run TCU. You would at least assume TCU would put up a little bit of a fight, but Georgia just that much better than everyone in the country. I don't care if you think Alabama should have been there. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. They didn't earn it, and TCU did earn earn a spot in the playoffs, beat Michigan, and just got absolutely destroyed by the best team in the country. Georgia's probably going to – I think at this point it's fair to say Georgia's going to three-peat. So that's the challenge. Do you think Georgia can go back to back to back? I don't think so. Stetson Bennett's going to be gone. As much as Stetson Bennett isn't like an elite quarterback by any means, there is something to be said with experience and knowing the system. And it would be a tall task to go back to back to back. Now, if they had a quarterback that was still there with one more year, maybe. I just – Personally, I don't think so. I, I Whether it's – I'm not saying it's going to be Oklahoma, but, I mean, Alabama's going to be in the same spot of replacing their quarterback. So will Ohio State. Tennessee. But, yeah, There's a lot I mean, of quarterbacks moving around. I think it's really going to be – it is kind of up in the air. 
the only reason I feel so confident about it at this moment is because they just killed TCU and their defense is still built of probably some of the biggest human beings on the planet. And they've got two freshmen, Michael Williams and Bear Alexander, mm-hmm. that are really good along the defensive line. So and Brock Bowers, that dude is the best for that. I think he was the best football player on the field. He might have not been the one with the best stats, but he oh, elite. commanded attention. Elite. So um you made it this far, like the video, do the in video challenge, subscribe to the channel, turn the notification bell on, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Apple, Spotify, and TikTok. Everything's linked in the description below. And remember, leave us a review on Apple and Spotify. It helps us out a lot. And we will catch you guys on Friday.